Hello YouTube, this is Matt Pullen, and I'm here to bring you some comments on my game against Grandmaster Eugene Perlstein. Uh, this game occurred last weekend in round one of the Chicago Open. Uh, Perlstein is the third Grandmaster that I have faced, the, uh, the other two being Dmitry Gervish and Nikolai Mitkov. I opened knight f3, uh, he played knight f6, and after d4, g6, uh, he played a king's Indian defense. And here, uh, white really has very limited options because he's committed this knight to f3. Uh, pretty much the only uh, standard move here is bishop e2, the classical variation. Uh, without this knight being committed to f3, there are a lot of interesting choices uh, for white in the king's Indian defense. For instance, if he starts with d4, and if knight f6, c4, g6, knight c3, etc., omitting knight f3, uh, white can play the sameish variation, the uh, Averbach variation, the four pawns attack, the Sarawain, and uh, whatever this is. But uh, if knight f3 then really you got bishop e2, which is the classical line, the, by far the most studied response to the uh, king's Indian defense. And sometimes white plays h3. But other than that, you, there's really not much. Uh, the move I played is a move I've been uh, experimenting with over the past uh, one or two weeks, trying to find some new lines to surprise opponents with in the king's Indian defense. The move is bishop to d3. And uh, this move is not at all popular today. Uh, this, uh, these two pieces, the uh, knight on uh, f3 and bishop on d3, they don't work very well together in the king's Indian. It's, it's an ugly variation. But, uh, you know, I've been working on some lines in this, and it's, uh, it's quite possible to play this way, although I still think there are some major obstacles, such as uh, the one that uh, Eugene Perlstein played against me. So yeah, he played knight a6. And uh, after castles, he played e5. I played a game against uh, Dmitry Shergitskov in a previous tournament where he played c5 against me. And uh, after, uh, after we reached sort of an unconventional Meroxy bind position where white had some more space, but uh, white was able to defend you know, both of the center pawns adequately, I went on to win the game eventually. But, no, uh, Perlstein played e5 against me, and this knight a6, e5 combination I had not faced before. So I played h3, like I did in the uh, Sergitskov game, although uh, it didn't turn out that well for me. I think maybe there are a couple better moves. Uh, Perlstein suggests that white has to play d5 here, and uh, this bishop on d3, he says, might make it difficult for black to play f5. One possible line is uh, knight h5, rook e1, knight f4. And here, actually, uh, the bishop can drop back to c2 to keep watching f5. But uh, I would prefer bishop f1, I think. And one idea here is if f5, then white exchanges the bishop for knight on f4 and then pushes past. Uh, this pushing past fixes this pawn on f5. So that in turn limits the bishop on c8. Although after you know pawn takes knight takes the scope for this bishop on uh, g7 is greatly increased. Another feature of this position is that White has healthier pawns. He has uh, four on three on the uh, queen side, and Black has a crippled four on three on the king side. So if this were an end game, White could make a passed pawn, and Black could not. However, the practical chances of this reaching an endgame without any kind of uh, structural change taking place are very, very low. So after e5, there's also uh, exchanging d takes e, d takes e, and then h3 with the idea of simply developing you know, bishop e3 and queen e2 and rook e1, etc. next. That's, this is also quite a legitimate way to play. In fact, uh, Ripka even thinks that white has a slight advantage in this line. But I played h3, trying to keep the tension in the center, and my opponent just captured right away. So already we see that he's setting up some play against white's center pawns on uh, e4 and c4. My opponent played knight c5, and I played bishop c2. Uh, the reason I play bishop c2, first of all, is because my bishop wants to stay looking at the king side. 
And second of all, it's because this bishop on c4 limits the squares of his knight on c5. So, you know, it's sort of two minor pieces playing against each other. Um, my opponent played rook e8, rook e1, c6. And here, the drawback of my strategy, I think, in allowing him to play e takes d is that my pawn on c4 is going to come under attack. Whereas if my bishop were on, I don't know, e2 or f1, then this pawn would not be as vulnerable. So I played knight b3, you know, because uh, this knight was hanging tactically to the bishop at times, and I just wanted to get him off and also to put pressure on the d-file maybe. So uh, bishop e6, attacking my weak pawn, and I play bishop f4, attacking his weak pawn, and he defends it with his bishop, which is really strange. Usually black doesn't unfeen cut a bishop like this, but it does hold his pawn. So I play knight d2 now. So my knight has returned to the second rank. It guards the pawn on c4, and it does not lock in this bishop on c1. So uh, black played a5 to keep the knight on uh, c5. I play queen f3, and knight fd7, because I might have been threatening to play bishop g5 to pin his knight. So he played knight d7. I play queen g3, setting up this battery, and he blocks it with knight to e5. And here I just moved a rook to the center. So here, I, mean, I moved my rook to a center square. I mean, all the moves looks, look good to me so far for white. But this position, I you know, it may be strategically busted already you know, because of the way the game turned out. Uh, I want to, uh, in addition to the pressure on the backward pawn, I want to eventually advance this f pawn, f4, f5, to open up some lines against the, uh, the black king. You know, hoping to take advantage of maybe of my bishop on c2, pointing at the king, and my rook's on the open files. Uh, he plays queen b6, attacking the pawn, and I guard the pawn. And he plays a4, trying to undermine the, uh, you know, do a minority attack of sorts to undermine the support of my c4 pawn. I instead play uh, bishop e3, creating a pin. He plays a takes, a takes, queen b4, and now bishop d4, because this knight needed guarding. So... I mean, I'm on the long diagonal with my bishop. My f pawn is free to advance now, f4, f5. And I was already thinking about, you know, how I was going to follow up my f4, f5 advance. So uh, I, I, was, uh, I was enthusiastic about the possibility of an attack because black's queen is locked so far deep into my queen side that it can't participate in the defense. If only I could open up some lines against uh, black's king. So my opponent played b5. But even if he plays uh, bishop g7, I can't follow through with my intended f4 advance because f4 loses material for uh, white after knight e d3. This threatens the bishop on d4 and also threatens the rook on e1. So uh, he played b5, and uh, a friend of mine, Matt Freeman, said you know that he had been following the game on. Uh, the uh, Chicago Open website, and he's like, hey, you played a great game against uh, Perelstein, but uh, you didn't call his bluff. And I said, what, call his bluff? What do you mean? And he said, well, when he played this pawn to b5, you can just take it. And then I said, hmm, I didn't think I could take this because I'm hanging a bishop. But no, I realized what he was talking about. I can just play knight takes b5. And uh, I don't know what my opponent was thinking to allow this move. I mean, he can't take this knight, because uh, bishop c3 and his queen only has one square to go to. And uh, then rook a1 just wins the queen. And he can't ignore the knight, because I'm threatening to, like, I don't know, fork and stuff. So the Ribka best line is knight a6, uh, bishop c3, queen c5, knight d4, knight b4, bishop b1. But here, I mean, this just looks like white's up a pawn. So I don't know, maybe I missed another opportunity against the GM when he played b5 and I didn't take it. Instead, I played f4, the move that I was locked on for, uh, you know, for most of the middle game. But this turns out to lose. After pawn takes pawn, pawn takes knight, pawn takes pawn, he's threatening this bishop and also this bishop. And I can't take on uh, c5 because then he takes back with check. I think that's what I missed. Anyway, this just goes downhill from here. Knight takes, knight takes, bishop takes, bishop takes, and now I play bishop 
I mean uh, rook to d3, and he takes here. And uh, I I can take this pawn. I'm I thought I think I saw some concrete line that discouraged me from taking this pawn in the game, but I'm not sure what it is. In fact, after queen c4, this white queen is overworked. So uh, one possibility is bishop d6, rook d8, e5, takes, 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 and then check, winning back the pawn. And if I'd gotten to this position against Perlstein, I would have resigned. So yeah, I didn't take that pawn, uh, probably because of that line, and I played back to f2 instead. And then after bishop c4, I went back to f3 with the rook. But this cuts off the rook from the back rank, which just leads to more trouble. So after a few more moves, it was quite apparent that I was lost, and I resigned. So yeah, that was my game against Eugene Perlstein. Sorry for cutting it a little short at the end. Have a good day.